the state of the economy right now. Mm -hmm. If a pedestrian who is perhaps on their way to work sees mangoes uh, strewn all over as a result of uh, an accident and then gets them, it says something. Yep. First take us through, paint us a greater picture on that. Well, it says very many things in that case. I myself grew up uh, picking mangoes uh, mm. in Hoima town. The privilege oh, okay. we had, the trees were along the streets. Along the streets, yeah. So all you needed was to stop by and within a minute you have 10 mangoes to mm. eat and your lunch is done. <laughs> you balanced. So this guy is balancing his budget. Ah. He possibly came to town and didn't have uh, what to have for lunch. Mm. Now he finds mangoes there. Nobody has control over them. Mm. Possibly the person who had them was just excited after surviving an accident and then and just to. took off. But also the man is helping to clean the city. If those mangoes stay there for another day, they will be rotting. Flies will be around. Maggots will be around. Why not take advantage of them? So. Ugandans must learn to take advantage of opportunities mm. as they come. As they come. Especially when those opportunities help you to balance your budget. Wow. Yep. There you are. I think it's something to think about, but it comes on the backdrop of uh, a rise and which is very exponential yep. of sure. commodities. Mangoes are also one of those <laughs> uh, <laughs> products yes. in the markets that, of course, people can no longer buy readily as they did. What's causing the current hike in prices? I think the word actually you've used is exponential or hike. Mm -hmm. Prices always go up. Ah, no so we, we shouldn't worry about no, that. No, you get worried when they move faster, Okay. which is the exponential increase or the hike in the prices. Mm. And that can happen largely because of three things. One is either because the demand has all of a sudden increased, mm. more people have come into the market who are not there. Which is possible. Or the people who are there have all of a sudden gotten more money, and so they want to mm. treat themselves to the best that they can. Mm -hmm. That is one window. We don't see that being true in Uganda. Mm. So that shall get shelved. The second option is supply gets distracted. That your supply chains, either bridge has been washed away, vehicles mm. can't bring in food, all sorts of things like we did we, we did have in some places in COVID, mm. especially for global supplies. So in that case, the demand has remained the same, but the supply has the supply retreated. Has, yeah. So then we all begin to scramble for the few things available, that are available. Few and then things. we are ready to offer any price, and then the prices will go up. The third thing is actually an increase in the cost of production. Things are still coming through, mm. but the manufacturers are now finding it a little bit more costly, costly to, to produce them. the same item so they have to pass it this cost on to the customer to the customers. now we see the second and the third in uganda that the cost of production logistical cost of transportation of things mm. has gone up but also in some cases the supply has gone down now the supply has gone down quite often over years mm. in uganda when you look at the trend of things there are certain items we used to produce we no longer produce them mm. to the level that we used to we've been relying more on imported mm. items mm -hmm. where now the logistical networks and foreign inflation has kind of uh, come in and affected us Okay, that talks to scaling up manufacturing perhaps, but of course that's a very long term, uh, it is a long term very long term solution. Mm -hmm. So what measures are in place right now, according to your own uh, observation of uh, how the Ministry of Finance is handling matters, what measures are in place to cushion uh, these adverse effects? Well, there are not very many options. Mm. Uh, what is in economics what you will term as a small economy open economy really. You mm. are like a small economy in a global world. Mm. We are looking at the, the barrel price for oil, which is one of the leading uh, causes mm. of this. Has increased really from around uh, 78, 780 dollars per mm. barrel, per barrel. Uh, about three, four months ago, to well above 100. Mm. So that there was that surge so above that 100, surge, and then yes. there was, you know. It, it, it went up to 130, 140. 135. But now it has come down, but you're still hovering around 100. Mm. Now, certainly, you'd expect that increase of 20% to be passed on into the fuel prices. Okay. And that's what we have seen. Quite a lot of fuel prices have moved from 4,000 to 4,500. Mm. You're really talking about a, an equivalent thing of about 20 mm. to 25% increase. So that's one thing that has come in. And then you have also some other disruptions of, um, because in Europe, their inflation was literally caused by too much money. Too much money. When they were in the lockdown, governments continued to pay households. Mm. Now, when the lockdown ended, all these households came out to buy cars, to buy things and items. <laughs> okay. So that's why you're hearing America has inflation they last, so in 1981. Mm. 
Now, how do they respond in the West? They increase interest rates because for them it is too much money. That's too much. You want to suck out that money. That's right. So for them, they raise their interest rates. Now we are also watching that space because if interest rates go up in the north and the west, mm. western countries, that means the dollars that were coming to Uganda may also, may creep, also back. creep back. So we might see a, a loss of value of the shilling, depreciation mm. of the shilling. As we go on. Now that could cause inflation here as well because it also drives inflation. Mm. Now that's one means that government has so far used to prevent it, it prices getting worse. That the dollar is still stable. Mm. And people need to notice that. The dollar is still hovering yeah. around 3,500, yeah. 3,550. So that is one immediate reason. If that deteriorated, then it would have a ripple effect or an additional effect cause inflation. Mm -hmm. So it's not true that government has not done anything. The central bank has at least tried to make sure we have a stable uh, shilling, mm. which is one thing they have done. The rest of the things, sometimes you just let people adjust. Even the mighty America, when hurricanes come, mm -hmm. they just tell their citizens, please, move, move uh, you'll come back after it has passed. Mm. So the bulk of it is going to be around individuals adjusting their own lifestyle because we've said government has nothing to do with oil. Mm. I've had people say remove the taxes. These taxes were about 1,300. Tax before. freezes. Tax freezes can do the job. But now they're asking for reduction. Mm. We haven't increased the tax. The tax for oil was where it was in December mm. when fuel prices were 3,800 okay. for diesel. Now it is 5,000. The tax is still the same. So you cannot blame something that has remained constant because our taxes are not pegged on the value. Mm. They are actually fixed. Okay. So they have been where they were in July. They are still where they were. Why right now when we are paying 5,000 shillings for a diesel. But also you want to look and see if government removes the taxes, what else are we going to use to pay the teachers, mm. health, health workers, and maintain our security? Isn't that oversimplification of our dilemma? When you say if we do this, then we won't be able to do the other. Planning is essentially the role of the government. Yes, and is. we can see many governments are intervening to ensure that there is the pain, especially to the citizens. Kenya did that. The president uh, introduced a subsidy for fuel to allow marketers not to hoard. And in fact, some of the measures that uh, were uh, pumped out in that particular rollout of measures was even the expulsion of uh, one of the yes. top marketers in the country. Now, that shows that a government is actually concerned and is ensuring that something is done. You just say that perhaps the citizens must be left to this is something that we shall outlast but kenya is doing something about it other countries are doing something about it what's so unique about uganda it depends on uh, your ability to do it and we know what happened in kenya mm. because they told them the price must be this mm. kenya has a tendency of going back to the obote two era days of capping and fixing prices mm. But because the, at some point, but the they government... Always, they always back off. The state, the state must act. They always back off. Mm. You don't want to act wrongly. Mm. Fine, act even if acting is simply telling people, I can't do much. Let's see how we face it together. Because the market will then guide you and mm. adjust you. You don't want to replace a market. There is nothing better than a market. Mm. They might malfunction. They might not be efficient, mm. but don't replace the entire market. Try to fix what is wrong with that market. As we say, even when you get an accident from a car, it's another car to take you to hospital. Mm. There's no replacement for cars. But because me, the other one has thrown me down, no more cars. <laughs> you are going to die on that road. So markets do not have an option. Mm. When Kenya fixed, they said, if the price goes above this, you marketeers continue saying that that price will mm. drop up for you. Before they need, they had an invoice of 600 billion. Mm. Kenyan shillings. Kenyan shillings. They could only afford 45. Now there was a bigger shortage when these people held on to their fuel and said, fine, now that you can't pay us what we have already put out there, yeah. we are going to hold it. Now Kenya said that is holding. That's not holding actually. So it's people it? reacting because you have not met your bargain. Mm. Why should I continue putting oil out there when you have failed to pay me for the previous oil? So I think they will come back and realize the mistake was on the government side. They should never have acted that way. Sometimes okay. some things you just let them go through. So what I'm getting from all this observation is that uh, we shall outlast this dilemma as yes. a country. And whoever is feeling the pinch, let them feel the pinch. It is okay. The pain will go. And then something will, act, will come up and yeah, we you shall just, be better. You just don't want to behave in a way that sends you off track and you never come back. So balance up yourself. Balance up your budget. Try to avoid the things you can avoid. Mm -hmm. Uh, what we'll be talking about, the bar of soap has mm. gone up. Yep. 
Uh, well, wash that shirt, maybe... Without washing the shirt. Once or twice. You must wash it look after for, wearing look, it. Look for <laughs> that dark colored trouser and put on that one. <laughs> if, you, if you're in the first one, putting on white ones. Uh -huh. Walk less. Try to do uh -huh. as much as you can. Eat boiled food if cooking oil is expensive. Wow. Boiled food is not bad, it is healthy. Wow. Try to find something somewhere that you can really adjust. You won't die if you don't get, eat that lunch. Isn't that a very academic approach? It's the not. hope that a Ugandan out there will understand the, what uh, what the plight is, and then you're hoping that Chris Higeni will use less oil. Perhaps will say, uh, "Now it's okay. Let me let meat be. Let's go for uh, dodo." Yeah. You, know? you, you see, the beauty with academics is we study what people do, mm. and then we document it, and it's okay. I think there seems to be a pattern here. Yeah, the translation into the practical usually yes, gets, so you, gets it, us it, the so point. So you study what question. people do, mm. you evolve a pattern. And then that pattern you document it, then it becomes an academic thing. But it's not abstract of what people are doing. Mm. We already have people who have adjusted their okay. lives out there. Now we are saying everybody, please adjust. We shall outlive this. Mm. If you must do anything, please save for school fees. Because mm. schools are going to increase their tuition. Yeah, for and them. By the way, there is one more thing that is coming our way mm. is the food price inflation. Food price, yeah, food inflation. The harvest hasn't been good. The seasons haven't been good for the last maybe fifteen months. Mm. So that also is going to trigger through, and it can be very, very nasty. So when the schools come in to buy grain mm -hmm. and beans in the next one week or two, so we might see food prices spiking in the month of May. Mm. Now, that means they will have to charge us more to keep our children. And we shouldn't be blaming the schools because they have increased the price, because even if the children were at your home, the price of food will have gone up anyway. <laughs> you would be buying more to feed them. We are okay. doing it already when they are on holidays. Well, you seem to espouse many of the tenets of uh, liberalized uh, free market economy, which Uganda seems to be very much comfortable with, especially on the part of uh, the planners. But within the workings of this arrangement, we again to s we begin to see the hand of the state mm -hmm. on projects that apparently or arguably favor some of the people within the state, the creation or attempts to create monopolies. Yep. How do you explain this? You're telling us we shall outlive this. Uh, the state cannot do much in terms of uh, fixing the economy to ensure that pain is eased. But this very state within that very economy mm -hmm. is taking such actions. I think that is where people forget where we have come from. The reason we liberalized was to avoid certain monopolies because one thing about a monopoly mm. is it leads to a higher price. Sure. A monopoly brings in a lot of inefficiency. You can get very bad quality goods because I'm the only provider. What mm. else can you do? Yeah, sure. They can decide what price to pay to the farmer and what price to pay to the consumer and whatever they want to do. So monopolies are always not a good thing. Mm. The only way you want to have a monopoly in economics is if the market is so small that it cannot accommodate more than one or two players. Then you want a monopoly. Now I see that tendency trying to come back. And monopolies can sometimes be by legal action mm. or favors. Or favors. As you have we seem to be seeing a lot of the other favors more than now, legal. Th action. That is something we really want to avoid. Because initially in the 80s, we used to have coffee marketing board. Mm. It was the only entity that could buy your coffee. That's right. And was paying whichever price it would decide. And from the numbers we, ha we have going back in time in the 1980s, mm. it used to pay just 30% of the international price of coffee. Mm to the farmers. Even that would come very late. Now when we liberalized, farmers began getting 70% of the price of coffee. Mm. And the same went through to other crops, maize, beans, and the rest of those. Some of them, like cotton, were being controlled by lint marketing board. Mm. Those things were moved. But also we had an opportunity to liberalize uh, the economy and say, what is government doing with all these corporations and companies? To get a telephone, you have to go to Uganda Post and Telecommunications. Mm. Today, anybody can get a phone from anywhere at whichever <laughs> price. The choice is yours. Is Those, that's the beauty of liberalization. Yeah, economy. sometimes you wonder whether the posts are still working. Exactly. Mm. People don't even know that post office used to be a post office and would go there and pick out. Mm. So you write PO box and they're like, what is that one? Now, that's the space of liberalization economy because it also adapts quickly to mm. technologies that are coming in. That's right. Now, monopolies wouldn't be bad as such mm. where they must occur. But they should not come in because of a government favor. Because that breeds kind of inefficiency, mm. a kind of patronage. What would you do? I'm protected by law. I'm protected by this. Then they become a mess in the economy. And we're going to see more of that distortion mm. if government does not go back to say, how do we fix the markets?
well you bring up you bring me to a question that i was simply i was just about to put to you how do we fix what is going on when we don't have a governor of the central bank somebody at the helm of managing the economy how things are running control of inflation and of course uh, mopping out cash and liquidity in case we need to right now we have a deputy no doubt there was a time we were told for example when uh, the late mr matebide was uh, ailing there are people who said can the man retire some uh, people within government were very categorical they're like this man is the vanguard is the pillar of the economy yeah. if he's away then we shall have a little bit of trouble the man has been dead for three months plus the economy is running we have a little bit of trouble and some can say where is the governor can't the governor be appointed sap not sap as such mm. uh, it's a process that takes time because the, as you've said during the time of Governor Mutevide, he, he, he was the, 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 the pillar. Mm. So you need to find a similar pillar because the governorship has two things to it. One, it is an institution. That's right. And that's why the economy is still running. Mm. The problems we're having is not because of the presence. No, of not of course. And certainly not. But markets do respond. To the markets do yeah, respond. They do respond to yes, such developments. They do respond, but yeah. they will watch tell signs of weaknesses within the institution, mm. which we do not have at the moment. The central bank is running, is making all the decisions it needs to make. You only need to talk to the banker. They will tell you no problem that they see as of now. Because the decisions are made by a monetary policy committee. Mm -hmm. They are made by a team. That team is still in there. And the governor superintends of providing. The problem the for economies like Uganda is that we see the problem after it has actually happened. And then we're like, all along, this has been yeah. going yeah, on. But by this time, at Couldn't least. Couldn't we be, aren't we in a position where there is something that is brewing that is going to completely throw us off balance? At least at this time, we haven't seen any problem. Mm. That's one thing. Now, two, the governor is also the person. Mm. The person should speak with authority because people want to trust the governor's message. Mm. If he just blinks and he looks like, <laughs> did he blink? <laughs> what did that mean? And markets yeah. can interpret that. They interpret that very and well. And we know very well at one point when people were in parliament, they mm. were saying the governor should be called here. Why did he do this? And mm. they, well, nobody can remove it. Not even the president. Mm. The markets must not worry. He was very clear. He was speaking to the markets. That's right. Not even to the president. He said, well, maybe God. And indeed, it was God who took him away. But it was indeed <laughs> asserting that statement. Yeah. Well, the governor must be the institution, okay. but also the authority. So replacement mm. of a governor is not just like appointing another uh, RDC mm. or district chairman. This is an institution you want to take caution, you want to take care, you want a knowledgeable person, you want a person with authority, you want a person who will speak to the president and say, Mr. President. Mm. This is my view. What you're effectively saying is that the country does not have such a figure right now. They do, but the process is on to look for who is the right person. You don't want to appoint a governor and then six months down the road you're like, oh, I wish I had known. Because that alone sends a signal, a wrong signal in the process that appoint, identifies a governor. Well, talking of wrong signals, doesn't that also signal that the country is a position where... I mean, at the end of the day, I've followed events across the globe. And when Chairman Jerome Powell yep. does not appear like he's saying something that he ought to say... <laughs> the the whole economy gets a little bit exactly tingly. exactly That's and here we are imagine a scenario where jerome powell is out of office yes. by any whatever case would it be a crisis no it's not a crisis aren't we giving this there is no time there's no time span i just wonder a governor should be in position to marshal things right now he should be in position yeah. There is no time span that uh, three months or six yeah, months. Three months is must too much. Yeah. Three it's, not too, it's not too much. That the, is the legal aspect, the technical. That not, so that's why the institution the, can survive. That's why even the law yeah. prescribes over other areas where you really want an office, an office hall. Mm -hmm. There, speaker. You see, a speaker within. Yes, because they are, it's weeks. a different business. The president. There are prescriptions on that uh, side, but on the governorship. It's a different trend. It's a different trend. The constitution yeah. just let it be handled amicably and let the process take its due course. There is no crisis as far as I'm concerned. Mm. We can spend another three months and this economy will not see any problem that because without a governor in the office of the governor. Is it a case that we have very narrow uh, markets, the, our, the way they act and uh, perhaps the power they hold? It is also the strength of the institution of the mm. central bank. We have spent the last 25 years building and strengthening the central bank. There was a time banks would be, I think in the 90s, the banks would be like, insisted by the Ministry of Finance. Mm. 
and then supervised by the central bank. Now, we reached a level we said, no, he who supervises should have the power to appoint and disappoint. Mm. So then the central bank line is the banks, and if the bank doesn't behave, that bank should go. And we've seen the central bank send away banks you'd never even imagine they would go away. UCB was one of them. Crane mm. was a recent one. Tefe, all sorts of banks have come and gone. Mm. If you don't behave according to the rules, the central bank will send you. That is how strong that institution is. Well, that's a very good observation you make, Tefe, and uh, all the other indigenous, indigenous banks. We shall go for a short break right now, but when we return, the conversation continues with Dr. Freda Mohomza. We shall be asking if KCB, if Kenyan banks are going into South Sudan, going into the DRC, what's Uganda up to after the break? Uh, good morning. We're glad you're still watching Morning at NTV. I'm Chris Higeni, and uh, on the show is Dr. Fred Mahomza, a renowned economist, and we are discussing the rising commodity prices and whether a government is out of options. Now, before today, there were people who were saying government has all the options that it can be able to intervene in some of these uh, issues and be able to rectify and ease your pain as a taxpayer out there who is grappling with the inability to buy things that you were able to buy six months ago. Now, from the economic point of view, well, it seems you might have to outlast this dilemma by simply uh, twitching a few things. For example, he says, if you are putting on trouser, a different trouser on a daily because of the soap issue, you're going to have to, for example, use three in a week and they should be dark, not <laughs> light, so that you do not uh, uh, grapple with aspects and, and avoid of uh, water and, 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 you know, avoiding the water puddles and stuff like that. If you are consuming heavily fried chicken, you're going to have to boil it so that you do not spend on oil. Those are some of the simple things an economist says can be able to help you overcome and outlast this particular uh, dilemma. Of course, as the state and uh, the economists and the technocrats go about the twitching of one thing or two to ensure there is a bit of uh, relief. Now, in the conversation before we came on air to return in this segment, we were speaking about fiscal policy and how things have gone wrong. Right now, we are at a debt burden of 73.8 trillion mm -hmm. Uganda shillings. Where, wh wh what's going on? What can, you know, a lot of money has been borrowed. I think it's going into public service and uh, maintaining some of these uh, issues, local governments that have a lot of cars. I don't know what exactly these cars do most of the time. But shouldn't we be able to realign the fiscal policy to arrive to where we need to be? I think you've just really said it. If you borrow money and you invest in things that do not uh, create wealth, mm. do not increase income, at a faster rate. That's right. You get back to the second category of inflation we talked about. Mm. That your supply is not happening, and yet your demand is rising. Now, in economics, there is a very interesting uh, model that I've been teaching my students mm. all over. It was the one that informed the structural adjustment program. Yeah. Okay. Borrowing means you are going to live beyond your means. Your economy You're using is able money you haven't earned your yet. economy is able to produce say about five billion dollars worth of goods. Mm. You want to live at eight billion dollars worth. Now that is going to begin realigning prices in your economy as people respond to the new trends in demand. Mm. Now anything that can be imported, the demand at home will be made through imports. Yeah. Now here's a country saying I have an import substitution strategy. You don't gain that with a very strong shilling, mm. which we have today. You don't gain that with an excessive increase in government borrowing, mm. which is consuming products that cannot be produced at home, or if they can be produced at home, they can also be produced from abroad. From abroad. Because the foreigners will come and feed you. And then there is the tendency to want those products produced abroad ahead of those produced locally. Locally. Yeah, of course, that is the, the, because abroad there is a lot more efficiency. Mm. This country is importing goods worth $7.5 billion per year, at least for 2021. Mm. Of that, India and China alone sold us goods worth $2 billion. India and India, China. India and China alone. Alone. When you add on Japan, Malaysia, and Indonesia, you go up to about uh, almost $3 billion. Mm. So four countries are literally selling us goods worth $3 billion. Now that means we are now supporting those economies and not our Not economy. our own. Now, it wouldn't be a bad thing if whatever you are importing is helping you to eventually grow your economy. 
to be able to meet whatever you demand locally, which you would say is either import substitution or you're also producing what you can sell to the other people abroad. Now, that has not happened. It goes back to fiscal policy, it goes back to our budget. And also, you're saying we cannot fix the inflation tendency now mm. through the short term measures because it is reflecting a structural distortion that has been happening over the last two over decades. The last two decades. You have borrowed money and put it into electricity which now cannot be used to produce goods and services. Mm. We have to import them. You've borrowed money and put it into roads, which roads are empty, because you never bothered to put money into the actual factories and the households mm. to increase their incomes and be able to do the local production. That's right. How do we cripple those? Because when you borrow, right now, as you look in our budget, you'll find about five trillion mm. of the budget is going to pay interest on what we borrowed. So it's not going to speak to this year. Yeah, so it's, yeah. But it's sitting in there. You have another order called refinancing money that is due to pay, but we cannot pay it. It's about eight trillion. So thirteen trillion in this budget is not going to speak to this year's production. But remember, we have to consume, so we are going to continue importing. Now we need to go back to fix the fiscal side of things. If we are to give a resilient economy mm. that we had in the nineties, but it takes tough decisions. Let's Good. Not forget. I need you to speak directly to Mr. Ramadan Govi. I know he's uh, under fire right now and embattled for his apparent. Uh, uh, there are some elements within uh, the country who think his ship is not steady. But uh, of course, uh, we understand that during the time of uh, Mutabide, as that is Emmanuel Tumusimia Mutabide, as permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance mm -hmm. and uh, secretary to the Treasury, that is when he made his mark on the economy. Yes. That is when he rolled out most of the uh, interventions that kind of made the man to be the pillar of the economy. Here we have a man who is new to the job. He's uh, a little bit, f he finds himself under fire. Mm -hmm. Would you speak to him? How can he handle this particular dilemma that he's facing? I think he's uh, doing his best when you say to stabilize the ship. Mm. You found so many bad situations. Mm -hmm. You are a doctor, but they have brought you a patient who is really already in a very bad condition. <laughs> You do not have a functioning ICU. Mm. You do not have nurses around who are well paid. You do not have certain drugs. But you must manage with whatever is available now. That recovery is going to take longer. Mm. You can even lose the patient. The good thing economies <laughs> never die. <laughs> so we recover it. But I like take that analogy. Mm. Because what we are looking at is we borrowed fiscal bonds themselves, which is government borrowing from yeah, the government public. And government, you know, brags and say, this is my money. This is <laughs> Any borrowed money is not your money for heaven's sake, it's Mr. Not government. Yours, uh, we have doubled that from about 10 trillion in 2018 mm. to 22 trillion in 2021. So between wow. 2018 and 2021, we have borrowed over 10 trillion shillings. What did that money do? do. What Ramadan finds himself with is to find interest mm -hmm. on that invoice and then chase what did this money do? And the money may possibly not be available anymore. And the mafia has its own asset. Either the mafia or they locked it up in projects <laughs> that are not giving you the thrust that you need. Mm. You know, you are that pilot and you're increasing the thrust, but your engines are not responding. Mm. What do you do with that plane? You possibly want first to ground it. Mm. Honorable Kasaja said the plane took off and he said, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. You left the passengers left. behind. You need to go back. <laughs> so we're trying to bring that plane back and go. And oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. Now, talking about a fiscal policy, we seem to have been uh, very, a few months ago, we were uh, we, we entered a trade surplus with the Democratic Republic of Congo. Sure. Yeah, and that is a bit of uh, a misnomer because, again, it is the, the DRC that we are building roads to be able to apparently improve our access to the doing of business. And then there is also the security uh, connection. We shall leave it at that. It's a discussion for another day. There are corporations within the region mm -hmm. that are making inroads in a very aggressive way. The Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, we have banks from Kenya, mm -hmm. we have these corporations that are taking advantage of the enormous potential that that market offers. Here we are, we haven't, I don't know whether there is a, a blueprint that can be adopted to ensure that companies from Uganda go to the DRC to make some money. Have you heard of any blueprint? Uh, there's not or necessarily a strategy. A, because we, we are hoping the private sector will see the opportunities mm. now and then come and work around a system mm -hmm. that can give them advantage. There is already some good private sector that are taking advantage. Mm. We have a lot of uh, gold exports, not necessarily all from Congo, mm. they come from different areas. <laughs> gold is right now our biggest mm. foreign exchange earner. 
So there were people who invested in gold refining in Entebbe and other yeah, places. Sure. So that's a private sector initiative. Mm. Now here we are saying the roads in the DRC are going to be opened up. What are these people buying from here? But we know they already buy a lot of things from Chicago, from our manufacturing. Mm -hmm. You want to consolidate want that. To consolidate that. Now, most people will simply look at um, the banks. Mm. But they forget, you know, the banks finance businesses. Yeah. So in the case of Uganda, I don't mind, mind whether you are financed by KCB or mm. equity, as long as the Ugandan business making the making trading the in the Congo yeah. and in the South Sudan. And these are our biggest trading partners. There are three countries, really, mm. where we export. South it Sudan. Is, it, is, it is Kenya, it is South Sudan, it's mm. the DRC. DRC. How do we consolidate? What are we selling there? You want to take a step back, as we said, fiscal policy. This money we are borrowing, can we put it in those areas we are selling to these neighbors? Mm. Even before you think of uh, refined, what is it called, coffee? <laughs> And we first you sell know, fish, maize, yeah, fish rice. A lot of, yeah. We are importing rice from Pakistan. Why? Oh, yet we have rice in Butaleja. We are importing rice. And so it's not there. That's the kind of thing you want to fix. And that can only be fixed through fiscal policy. Okay. And that's going to be, I think, Rama's biggest business. Mm. And we are going to be supporting with a lot of research work. Uh, from where he came from, now moves with the economics forum. Mm. He had a, he was running an economics forum, mm. and some of us have stepped in there to say, okay. let's generate the research knowledge mm. that government needs. Because one or two things that I would say that helped uh, the late Professor Mutemire to steer this economy in the 90s. One mm. was he based his evidence on the research work. Mm -hmm. Two, he had a very good political rapport with the president. Let's not forget during that time, mm. Mr. Seven was both president and speaker. Yeah, speaker, yeah. He took tough decisions. So we need to take this back to say, Mr. President, we need tough economic decisions made mm. on the political side. The political Short side. of that, this inflation will continue, the budget will continue with big deficits, revenues won't come through. We want to make this plain clear mm. to the president so that as he did in the 90s and 80s, let him do now. Then we'll get this economy back running. It can take us another one year or two. But we'll be there. Okay. The workings of economics, of course, speak to the gentleman who is now at the helm of it. Economics that works, that has found itself in a little bit of uh, an unclear and uh, muddy waters. But we do believe the PSST will be able to come through and offer some real solutions. What I must emphasize is that some of the remarks and uh, the way the PSST communicates is tone deaf. And usually, when you're tone deaf, people begin to think you're not doing anything. You're not doing anything. You know, and exactly. I think that's a PR we shall be issue able to that should that. be And by the way, one more thing we need to add is a, a weak economy mm. undermines security. Undermines security. That's why the first thing when Russia came in was to hit its economy, <laughs> not its tanks and, uh, <laughs> and missiles. So we need to strengthen this economy mm. to secure our security. Let's return to strengthening the economy. There is a lot of talk right now, and the, uh, the coffee cup is brewing in the country. Yes. There are so many people saying this and the other, and then we have an investor who seems to be to have a knack mm -hmm. for controversy and of course uh, that is Eric Capinetti and the Uganda uh, Vinci Coffee Company. There's been a lot of talk yeah. about the creation of a, mon a monopoly but the other day I was reading and understanding that uh, what the company looks at is around 25% of the coffee within the country to be able to manage Possibly it, even, which yes. might not be a monopoly but yeah. however the workings of the infrastructure of the economy perhaps put them in a position where they will be able to take the larger chunk because they will have the infrastructure, that is if the processing plant is established. Erika Pinetti and UVCC is not good for the economy right now, is it? I may be wrong. Well, when you say right now, <laughs> <laughs> you carry a point. Uh -huh. As I've said, the current problem this economy has, getting that uh, soluble coffee, mm may be a good desirable thing to have. Yeah. But possibly not in 2022. Not in 2022. If you got your money as Mr. Government, which you are borrowing literally mm -hmm. from elsewhere, you possibly want to invest it in the upstream of the coffee to improve the coffee beans, uh, the quality for all the farmers, mm. and many other things. We're still lacking extension staff. Now, this soluble coffee factory might actually find a problem getting the coffee it expects to get mm. if we do not invest in the upstream where the coffee is supposed to come from. So you want to make sure that side is well covered. They also run a danger because you're not going to force any, this is a liberalized economy, mm. you're not going to force Muhammad to sell my coffee to you. Yeah, sure. I will have to look at the market price and right mm -hmm. now we pick it off the web and say unless you're offering me this, I'm not giving it to you. Mm. So we can even go back to the Amin days, 70% of the coffee was smuggled. So if you give farmers a very poor price, mm. they will have an option of smuggling their coffee and take it elsewhere. So they need to see that 
the privileges they have do not give them a leeway in the market. Mm. You're not going to force farmers to sell to you. You must compete along with others in order to do this. So this investment needs to be analyzed with what we call sensitivity analysis. Mm. Supposing the 60,000 tons of coffee, tons of coffee do, not turn up do not turn up for one reason or another, either because worms and diseases have wiped out the coffee, mm -hmm. Will this business still survive? Or people have decided to sell to Soweva. But especially when you look at the fact that the investor in question uh, failed to turn up at one point when the creation of uh, another f uh, mega project that is in Voa. Yeah. Well, you could be certain that the 60,000 tons might not turn up. The people may not, the factory may not pick up as fast, mm. and farmers may get other options. It happened to us with the Soroti Fruit Factory. Mm. When we began this conversation in 2007 to put a factory, there was a lot of fruit in Soroti. Yeah, a lot of fruit. Then the factory took 10 years to build. By that time, <laughs> By the people time had found you know, other options. Okay. So it is possible also mm. here that dynamics might happen. The, the planning thing, process is Coffee farmers have options. They will keep growing the coffee. Mm. But they have to plan for competing with every other player. Let's this is not a monopoly and nobody should say Pinet is creating a monopoly. No. It's a credibility it It's a credibility it's issue. It's a credibility issue on the person. On the the person. business may be good. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you say, well, the timing is good. First mm -hmm. go and improve yourself before you come and present yourself to this beautiful girl. Ah, interesting. Let's keep it to farmers. The smallholder farmer out there. It might not be coffee. It could be some other yes, uh, produce. And they are grappling with a lot of things. They seem to be stuck. And the government has told them we are stuck too. Please wait out. Uh, what are we looking at in the next uh, three months? What kind of crisis? If the farmers are stuck, the government is stuck, the solutions? Aren't we going into some sort of crisis? It goes back to the structural issue. The, the foundations of an economy are households. Mm. And in the case of Uganda, 75% of these households are in the farming are in community. the farming communities. Now, our failures to really do agriculture that works wow. is what we are paying for now. Mm. Because even the, your body is made up of those tiny, tiny cells. You get COVID, the doctors will be targeting your uh, lungs yeah, to put the oxygen there. The but that's why no they want to end. They even want to thin your blood, make sure the oxygen goes to the mm. cells. So we must make sure what policies do we have to empower the households. And we've been grappling with things. Mm. In Tandikwa, I don't know prosperity for all, I don't know. Mm. None of them has really delivered because we make them more political than technical. Than technical. Now, this is the time to say politics aside. Can we do the technical is that even, right is that even do? Is that even possible? It has to be possible because it can't happen. Then we are going to continue in this kind of situation for long. I've already told you in Europe when, when COVID struck, mm. they targeted households. They targeted household. Keep giving them. Don't even give money to the manufacturers. Once give you give household. money to the household, they are going to come to the manufacturers. Yeah, sure. You give it to the manufacturers, they will either hold it or ship it out or bank account. Because they already have deposit a, it. Yeah, so if you are to do that circular there. flow of income, mm. put the money into the household, pump the oxygen not in the legs, in the lungs, <laughs> then the lungs will take it everywhere it's supposed to go. <laughs> Until we get that household yeah, model, okay. which is our demand, then we are going to continue having a structural problem. We're glad we are hosting an economist on our morning at uh, NTV this morning to discuss uh, rising commodity prices and whether government is out of options. According to Fred Mahomes, the government has the options at its acting steadily as it ought to act. Now, the person out there the average Ugandan is grappling with so many issues away from the rising uh, price of uh, commodities. People are desperate to be able to do something that works. They want to do businesses that shall be able to bring forth th something. You are an economist. You know where the money is, where it can be put and it generates a lot more money. Just speak to the average Ugandan there who has 500,000, a million shillings, two million shillings, because those are the people we are speaking to. Salaried earners who have saved a little bit of money and want to go into a venture that can bring them something and be able to live a sustainable life. The first thing you want to notice is every time you set up a business, it's not your business. Mm. It is their the business. The customer's business. I want to believe what determines whatever programs you do here is not because you decided. No. It's what do the customer need. So anybody who wants to set up a business first say, for whom am I setting up this business? Mm. And economics begins there right in senior five. Who are you producing for? What are you producing for them? Mm. When do you want to do it? And then how? Because the how means if you produce it expensively, mm. you will miss the market. Don't make a chapat of 10,000. 
<laughs> Nobody would buy. So if it's about <laughs> chapati for who? Mm. So use that ramshackled thing, work by the roadside where you don't have additional costs because mm. you really want to bring that chapati price down 500, mm. not more than 1,000. Okay. So if you want to really set up a business, try to look at the market trends. Mm. What, what is the competition? What is the future of that market? If you're going to do a salon, where are the others? Mm. Mm. If you're going to buy a border border, People will always move. Yeah, sure. Then you only want to say we are very many, but also the people moving are many. Are also many. So I'm going to plug into this. Mm. But if you are going to do fishing and mm. you want to produce fish, for who exactly? Mm -hmm. Because your fish is going to come out at twenty thousand or fifteen thousand. Mm. Who is going to buy it? Why don't you do nakati, dodo, and melon? You have seen people even melon. We used to buy melon a whole. Mm. Then they realize not everybody can afford the whole melon of eight thousand. These right. guys are slicing it. Mm. You want one for five hundred? They will slice. They will slice it. it. This is how we are eating yeah. fene. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to invest by looking at them mm. because economics we say aggregate demand equals the economy. Mm. So look, is there demand for what you want to produce? And that's why we're saying households mm. are the core. But unfortunately in Uganda we look at manufacturing Manufacture. and industries. We have built our economic structure, roads, energy, tax incentives, giving free land to the manufacturers. Mm. And we've forgotten, before the manufacturers, there must be the households. Once the households are available, these guys can do anything mm. in on the production side. How often do you engage uh, state actors and the technocrats within the Ministry of Finance and all the other uh, planning departments on how to do some of the things? Because when you say we've done the wrong things for the last 25 years, then the person listening out there becomes totally deflated. Like for 25 years, the planners we are looking at right now have completely failed to do the job. Do you engage at a certain level and address some of these concerns as either a think tank or an association of economists in the country? Very regularly we do engage, but as I've told you, things have changed. Because I've been in this space for the last 30 years. Mm. That's why I can confidently say that we work with the Mr. Uh, Mr. Tebide. Tebide in the 90s, mm -hmm. through the early 2000s, who've been in this space. I was even an advisor in the ministry for eight years. Mm -hmm. So I know the internal dynamics, that mm -hmm. even when the technical issues are put on the table, mm -hmm. decision making can be a little bit more dicey. There will be the politics of the day, there will be the sociology of the day. In Uganda, you have the religion of the day. You have the tribe of the day. You have all sorts of things to deal with. Now, sometimes wow. don't distort us. But as we always say, there must be a senior pilot mm. who will take charge. Take charge. And in the case of Uganda, that's going to be the, the, pres the person of the president. Because as we said in the earlier days, mm. there was a very small parliament, NRC, 35 members. Yeah, 35 Those members. guys took tough decisions. When you say there's going to have to be somebody take charge and the president is who you cite, he has spoken of uh, convening a caucus of the National Resistance sure. Movement uh, in the next week to discuss the economy. And personally, I do believe that uh, members of parliament in their core right now do not have the capacity to discuss solutions mm -hmm. to the economic issues that we are grappling with. They may have the mandate to reinforce and put into uh, action or rather drive the other MDAs within government to work on what technocrats have. Do you find this whole tenants of the caucus meeting to discuss issues like these tenable for the economy and the state? It's good because people expect... I'm afraid we're going to have to go a little bit political there. People expect <laughs> them to discuss. Yeah. So they are going to do the political thing as you've said. Mm. They are going to discuss. But what are they going to discuss? What will come out of their discussion? Mm -hmm. These must be informed by the technical side. So it's mm -hmm. my prayer mm -hmm. that we, the technocrats, work ahead of that caucus meeting mm. and get a brief before the president which will guide the conversation, okay. which will read to the caucus. If we don't do that, then the politics will carry the day. Now, even if we do that, it's not to say that we will win as technocrats. Mm. No, it's technicians. not a case of winning or losing. Who, exactly. It's a case of uh, what progress is made. Uh, and economics is usually, points. if you do this, this is what may come out, this is what mm -hmm. may come out. So you want to give them the option. The decision must be made by the caucus. Mm. But you want, when they sit down to make that decision, they have all the options well laid out clear. Mm. So I think the technocrats, now that the president has signaled, need to work round the clock yeah. to make sure by that time, the yes. brief, good brief, summary, simple, but very <laughs> clear, 
<laughs> is before the president, mm. is before the caucus leadership, and we're going to do our best. Mm. As you said, how regularly we engage, it's regularly. Mm. Very regularly we engage these processes. Because mm. okay. we are interested in the common person, the whole economy belongs to us, we belong to it. If we go down, we all go down together. So we want to put up these things, but as we say in economics, the pass mark is never 100%. Mm. If you get some 50, you have passed. Good enough if you get 80, that is an agreement. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do our best. If you get some 50, <laughs> the yes, economy yes. right now and whoever is uh, uh, doing their best to ensure that uh, there is a stabilization of prices, I think they are getting a 51. Not so? Yes, stabilizing. They are passing, but... Yeah, we are in a global storm, <laughs> but also which has found, as we said, with mm. COVID underlying conditions. underlying conditions. So I don't want to blame this entirely mm. on the global events. Mm. We had our own underlying conditions. If we were produced on sunflower on. and you know? sim-sim, mm -hmm. and we had households that were resilient, not everybody is complaining, by the way, about this fuel thing. Ah. Because there are people who had some reserves. They haven't oh, reached the sure, limit. Sure, but sure. But if you really had already reached your limit or even you are below the limit, mm -hmm. then you have a problem then for such a situation. So you need to make sure Ugandan households have sufficient income that when such storms come, mm. they do not crumble on the first day like we did with COVID. Mm. So that's the thrust, but that can only be medium to long term. And only if we take the right decisions, which we haven't done all of them in the last set of years. Well, out there it would be unfair to ask you for your parting remarks, but unfortunately it is a show. I'm going to have to ask you for your parting remarks. Fellow Ugandans, we're in this together. It takes you to take your decisions and live by them. If I wasn't just me taking my own decision, I would have mm. said, well, everybody in my primary school failed. Who am I to pass? Mm. But I said, I said, I have to beat you. But I beat it from those rural schools 